So ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you all for joining us today for this lunchtime session. Uh, and we'll welcome you to another great session for the FinTech Tour 20, the largest cluster of FinTech events in the Middle East. I am Sagar Shah, I'm part of the FinTech Saudi team. And for this lunchtime session, we're really pleased to be joined by Henry Aslan. Henry is the PwC Global Crypto Leader, the former chairman of the FinTech Association of Hong Kong and an adjunct professor at the University of Hong Kong where he teaches the first FinTech university course in Asia. Thank you very much, Henry, for joining us. Um, just to give a bit of background about Henry, he advises many world-leading crypto exchanges, investors, financial institutions, and tech firms on their FinTech and crypto initiatives, as well as numerous governments, regulators, and central banks. He has over 500,000 LinkedIn followers, is a TEDx and global keynote speaker, is the best published author, um, and has been on uh, numerous global media channels, including Bloomberg, CNBC, CNN, and the Wall Street Journal. He was also named uh, by LinkedIn as one of the top global voices in, fin in economy and finance, and is the host of FinTech Capsules and Crypto Capsules, which I'm sure Henry will be able to tell a little bit more about. Um, he was recently named by Analytica as, one of the, as the number one most influential individual in finance globally. Uh, so we are uh, extremely thrilled to have him with us today. Uh, just to add his latest book, The Fi Future of Finance, The Impact of FinTech, AI, and Crypto on Financial Services, is available and was ranked by Amazon's uh, global top 10 bestsellers in financial services. Um, so today, thank you very much for joining us, Henry. We're really pleased to have you here and, uh, and pleased that you'll be providing us with a guest lecture on the future of money and the emergence of digital assets. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat box and uh, put any Q and A's that you have forward and we'll try to get through as many as we can um, at the end of the session. So over to you, Henry, thank you, thank you very much. Awesome, thank you very much. I'm just gonna share the presentation so we're all live and uh, just let me know, Sagar, if you're able to see it. Uh, guys, Salam alaikum, very, very happy to be here with you all today. Uh, very, very excited. Uh, you know, I was last in, in Riyadh a couple months ago before COVID hit, and I look forward to being back in, in, per, in person with all of you. Again, thank you very much also to FinTech Saudi. You're really a, a big fan of what FinTech Saudi is doing, and of course, the FinTech Tour. Uh, and thank you for all of you on the line. I know you have a choice of doing many things today, and thank you for uh, giving me uh, the next couple of minutes of your life uh, so that I can share the, my passion for the future of money and be able to and some of the trends that we are seeing in this space. Um, so over the next couple of minutes, uh, what I want to do is very, very, very simple. I want to share with you all some of the latest trends that we are seeing when it comes to the future of money, the emergence of digital assets, and being able to actually hopefully empower you with this information and knowledge, and then let you make your own decision on what you think the future of money may look like and what will be the impact of digital assets on the space. And really to kick it off, and often when I spoke to a lot of people in the industry, they told me, oh, you know, uh, times are tricky right now. Oh, let me just put this here just so I can access it. Uh, obviously, times are tricky. There's a lot of headaches right now. We're in 2020 has been a very difficult year, obviously, with COVID and the economic crisis that has ensured. But I have a message to you all today that this is the most exciting time in the history of money, the future of money as we know, it is being shaped really in front of our eyes. Literally, our kids and our grandchildren will look back at the period we're going to right now and really say, wow, this was really a groundbreaking moment where we saw a lot of change when it comes to the future of money. But before I start any presentation on the topic of the future of money, I always give this piece of advice and a warning, um, especially when it comes to digital assets uh, and you know the broader crypto asset space, you need to be really careful because whoever tells you they're an expert in this space, you have to run away. Uh, I can tell you I spent 24 seven of my time in this space. And despite Sagar introducing me as an expert, I can tell you that I have absolutely no idea what's gonna happen even one month from now because this industry moves so fast. I always say a week in the space is like a week, you know, in a traditional, a day in the space is like a seven days in a normal world. It's a bit like dog years, you know, because this industry is moving very, very fast. However, that being said, there's I think a couple of things that we can agree on is really what COVID-19 has had a really ir irreversible impact when it comes to the future of money. And why this matters to you watching this right now 
is that as a, either you're in the fintech industry or the financial services industry, we need to understand these changes going on to be able to not only anticipate what's coming in, but also being able to capture the opportunity opportunities that it provides. And to do this, I'm just going to focus on four things today, not more, not less, and hopefully share with you the background to these four de- trends, the global developments, and let you make your own decision. The first one will be digital assets. Then I'll talk about stable coins. I'll talk about central bank digital currency, especially with Project Albert that was just announced uh, in Saudi Arabia. And obviously I'll finish up with tokenization. And hopefully with this, we'll be able to cover what not only financial institutions need to look at, but also potentially a lot of fintechs as well. Hope you're ready. Let's kick it off. Let's start with digital assets. But before that, I want to give you guys a brief history of money. Because that's very important. If we want to try to understand what is the future of money, we need to look at the characteristics of what is money. And this is actually very interesting because when you look at it, uh, there's really three characteristics that over the, 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 the years we see and we look at and to actually determine how we see money. First, it needs to be store of value. Again, if something is, 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 has no value, it cannot be considered money. It needs to be medium of exchange, something I can use to buy and sell goods and a unit of account, something that I can actually uh, measure the value of certain goods with. And what's interesting though, these characteristics of money that many of us in the academic world, in the professional world take for granted, have evolved over the last decades and centuries and millennials. For example, back in the day, it used to be cattle. Cattle was actually the unit of measure and the money people were using. Then it went to become shells. Actually, for a very, very long time, shells were used as kind of the, the money, as we know today, of taken from some parts of the world and being used across the world. Then we started having the first coins that appeared as around 600 BC, modern coinage. When a lot of the emperors back in the day realized they could put their face on, on, on money and actually being able to give it certain value. Then we actually moved to what we call the leather money, actually in China, where it started, where you start having the first kind of banknotes, if you want equivalents, uh, be made on leather before a couple of centuries later, move on to a paper and paper currencies notes that we had. And this was not only by doing Asia, but also happening in parts of North America as well, where you had things like the wampum that were used by a lot of the Native Americans for a very, very long time. And actually in many parts of Canada, for example, only being uh, kind of uh, not, not a be admissible only a couple of decades ago. And of course, then things moved on. In 1862, we had the U.S. dollar that appeared, the first banknote. By the way, fun fact, do you know why it's called the greenback? You know, obviously, it was initially uh, printed in, in color green for one very simple reason. At the time, they figured nobody, if we, if we use a green color, nobody is going to be able to copy this because at the time, only technology was available to be able to copy in black and white. So it shows you how things have changed from that perspective. But of course, the use of dollar evolved. And at the in 1971, the gold standard, until then, uh, money was backed by gold, actually was the end of that famous gold standard that we've had. And obviously, then we innovated until the, the, the 2000s when we had digital payments. Actually, Saudi Arabia one of the leaders in the world right now when it comes to digital payments, uh, really that has been really at the forefront and as we know, uh, money today. And of course, about 10 years ago, we had the rise of digital assets, which brings me about the topic that I want to cover as, as the, one of the first four items to cover today. But first, it's really important to understand what is the problem that we're trying to solve. If you think about it today, if I, want, if I come and I give you a banknote, a good old traditional banknote, you take it, you look at it, and as long as you make sure that it's not a fake one, you know that you have it. You know, uh, once I give it to you, you have that banknote. The problem becomes when we be- move this to a digital methodology of payment. Let's say if I take a picture with my iPhone of this banknote, it's great. I can send you a picture of it. But of course, nothing guarantees that I'm not going to send the same picture of the, of the banknote to other people, which is the problem that we call a double spending problem. And this has actually, believe it or not, this was a problem that we had for a very, very long time. The way we solved it, pretty simple way, is we actually put intermediaries, like payment companies like or banks, that act in the middle between the receiver and the the sender and the receiver and make sure that the money is not double spent. However, many people were trying to come up with a way of doing so. How can we fix this double spend problem without using intermediaries? 
And of course, we're able to solve this in 2008 when blockchain was created by a gentleman called Satoshi Nakamoto, which was the Bitcoin white paper, where we really found a way to, for people to send money to each other payment without using traditional intermediaries. And it comes back to the model. Back in the day, originally, you were using traditional intermediaries when you're sending a payment to each other. And with blockchain technology, we're able to actually, for the first time, send peer-to-peer -peer payments in a way that is actually uh, avoids us a double spend problem. So obviously this was 2008, it started in 2009. And by the way, very interesting fun fact, in, in 2008, when uh, this white paper was written, the word blockchain was never used. They talk about chains of blocks, blocks of chain, but actually the term blockchain as we know today was actually coined in 2015 Believe it or not, from The Economist magazine and Bloomberg, who started using the term in one of their issues. And since then, 2015, the word blockchain has been quite mainstream. But until then, it was not the case, uh, you know, until really. So it's a kind of historical fact, interesting about that fact. But what happened was obviously blockchain technology, uh, Bitcoin digital assets were pretty much wordless. People were trying to put some value until then. Uh, yes, there were some transactions, uh, but really the first time that it really put a, we were able to put a value on it was in 2010. We're literally, and I know it sounds crazy right now, somebody bought pizza for 10,000 Bitcoin. This sounds like right now, like the worst transaction you can even make because actually that pizza now is worth over $100 million US. Uh, but at a time, obviously nobody knew that these digital assets had any value. And of course, if we fast forward 10 years from then for now, of course, now the whole digital assets world is worth billions of billions of dollars. And the P is being used now from, from uh, by uh, over 100 million people around the world, including in the Middle, Middle East, by the way, where we're having really the amount of value and transactions of digital assets in the Middle East increase uh, year on year. It's about now 5% of all the value of, of digital assets uh, being shared around the world. And that actually has been which is something we're seeing now across many countries uh, across the region as well. But what's really interesting, though, is we are seeing now increased interest of digital assets post uh, uh, the COVID-19. For example, following the record levels of quantitative easing that we have seen around the world, there's more and more people interested in the topic of what is money, what is the history of money, how, does, how is money created, and also what is the future of money. And that is particularly the case when you look at a lot of millennials. Actually, what we found across the world where there's a lot of interest when it comes to money, how it's created in the future of money, especially digital assets, you'll see it's particularly uh, popular with the younger generation, with a lot of millennials who are increasingly interested on the topic. So very interesting from that perspective. But one thing though I wanna, I wanna look at is really when you look at um, what is really the opportunities that we are seeing in the FinTech industry, but also the financial services industry with digital assets. One thing that's very interesting is actually when you look at it, the, um, the entire industry has been really uh, adapting and growing over the last couple of years. Originally, the digital asset space was being driven by a couple of startups, maybe somewhere in Silicon Valley. But now you have an entire ecosystem that has been growing up that is here to provide services to the space. Many of the players now are becoming very institutionalized. You know, some of them are becoming uh, quite uh, being audited and actually becoming uh, in this, uh, putting in place the same controls features that a lot of traditional banks have. Also, now we have a lot of guidance on anti-money laundering, KYC. For example, uh, as of now, pretty much uh, for any digital asset transaction that takes place around the world, uh, you need to have the same kind of level of KYC AML that you have in traditional banking services, uh, what we call the uh, travel rule, which was issued by the FATF uh, last year. Big focus on AML and sanctions. Again, uh, the whole digital asset space right now is covered uh, by the broader, uh, you know, sanctions monitoring and AML uh, monitoring that we all we're all familiar with from a, a traditional financial space. But also, what's been interesting: a lot of players in this space have become increasingly institutionalized. You know, uh, if you look at many of these players, for example, right now, not only they have put in place, you know, often best-in-class KYC AML, there's third-party audit going on. Many of them have developed this institutional mindset. So again, the whole industry has grown up over the last one or two years. And this is really, as we look at the future of money, future of finance, this is playing an increasingly important role. One of the reasons is actually because we have increasingly regulatory clarity and regulatory enforcement in this space. 
Today, for example, only 5% of regulators, according to Cambridge University, do not have somebody working on digital assets. And you're seeing increasingly from a regulatory clarity perspective, regulatory engagement perspective around the world, a lot of focus on this topic. And by the way, it's not only regulatory, it's also tax. One thing we're seeing now around the world is as these new digital assets are becoming mainstream, we're having increasingly tax clarity to come and achieve, which is very important as we're seeing a bit more the asset class becoming institutionalized. Good example this year for the first time in the United States, every single American had to fill out a form uh, actually uh, stating whether they have uh, 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 been active in digital assets in the last year. But what's probably the most exciting in the space right now is how you're seeing the entry of institutional players come into space. A lot of traditional banks now entering the space and looking how they can play a role when you look at the future of money. You know, And there's been different ways of doing so. Some financial institutions have been decided to invest in digital assets, providers. You've seen some like firms like Goldman Sachs, for example, who have been doing this with some of the providers in the, in the US. Others have been partnering with some of these firms. For example, if you look at firms like uh, Nomura, the, the Japanese investment bank, they've been partnering with, firm, uh, with a firm like Ledger, which is based in France, to try to, try to come up with custody of digital asset solutions that people can use. Others have been launching in-house solutions. And others, like for example, Fidelity, have been launching their in uh, brand new entities, completely separate from the existing organization to try to focus uh, on this topic. And that is very interesting because now we are, as you're seeing traditionally more and more financial institutions enter the space, it brings not only a lot of the credibility to the space, but also a lot of the, 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 the market participants get a lot of more trust and confidence because they're able to deal with, with, with players that they're already familiar with. And actually, a lot of these players are moving forward pretty quickly. You know, JP Morgan, for example, is launching this JP Morgan coin, and other, other firms are looking at similar initiatives as well. Which brings the fundamental question that you need to think about when we look at the future of money. Can digital assets, being one of the four items that I, I've been talking to you guys about today, be an opportunity for the fintech and the financial services industry? We'll try to answer this up towards the end of the presentation. So second one that I want to talk with you all is really when it comes to stable coins. So what is a stable coin? Stablecoin is really digital currency that is backed one-to-one -one by fiat currency. So again, if we look back at the example that I, this, a very simple example, if you look at an asset like, for example, like Bitcoin, it is completely decentralized. The value is purely offer and demand. Whereas when it comes to stablecoin, it is digital currency that is backed one-to-one -one by fiat currency. And there's been many examples of this around the world. So many of them have been regulated. U.S. dollar coins that you see in the U.S. Uh, some of them have been not regulated, uh, like Tether, which is now the biggest one. And others are completely based on DeFi, a really kind of decentralized finance uh, that I'll, I'll, I'll mention a bit later on in the presentation. But really what is important here is actually the volumes of stable coins that we are seeing right now in the market is, is increasing pretty quickly. We're seeing more and more interest on the topic. We're seeing more and more usage. But wait a second. You may say, but what is the point? Why do we even need this? What is the point of a stable coin if its value is always $1? If, if today the certain asset is going to be worth $1 today, $1 in a week, $1 a year from now, what is the point? Well, actually, but that is the main benefit uh, because there's a lot of purpose for this. Let me give a very simple example. Cross-border payments. Today, when let's say, uh, you know, if I want to make a payment uh, from Hong Kong, where I'm based right now, uh, let's say to, to, to my family members in Armenia, uh, what I need to do is obviously, it's, it, there's a lot of fees, it doesn't happen instantaneously, uh, and there's obviously a lot of cross-border uh, fees and elements involved in it. Uh, and this is actually one of the benefits of stable coins, where it basically allows us uh, to send an asset of value, again, think when you think about the future of money, across borders for the first time, in a way that is actually stable, uh, instantaneous, and also works 24-7, which is something obviously we've been trying to achieve for many years and when it comes to cross-border payments, is to be able to have something that works all the time, 24-7, with low fees, and then also that works all the time. And this is actually, there's a lot of use cases as well, but let me, let me give you one of them that this is actually generating a lot of buzz right now in the industry when we talk about the future of money is when it comes to remittances. Today, I mean, obviously, the global remittance industry is, is huge. 
Uh, and what's really fascinating is that the average fee to send right now money around the world is 7%. This is the global average fee. I mean, think about it. In many countries in Africa, uh, parts of the Middle East, parts of Southeast Asia, it's actually double digit. Uh, you know, and it's, it's, we're talking pretty, uh, pretty serious amounts of money here. We're talking of over $500 billion a year sent by over 250 million migrants around the world. This is think about your uh, driver from the Philippines who is sending money back home or you're made from India or whatever other places. This is really actually generating, there's a lot of money and a lot of these fees are being paid by the people who can afford it the least. And this is why it's becoming interesting where people are trying, when they think about the future of money, the future of payments, they say, is there a way that we can use stable coins to change this? Actually, as we know that stable coins allows us to send money globally 24 seven, no fees and, and with our intermediaries, which is very important. So again, if you're thinking you're today a payment company, you're a financial institution, as these kind of uh, di uh, digital assets become more and more mainstream, what is going to be the impact on your business? And of course, all these topics were being discussed before. It was very high level. In many cases, it was only discussed at academic conferences. And all this was great until basically something happened in June 2019. And what happened in June 2019? Was it a company that you all know very well? Facebook announced Libra that uh, was going to be announced. What Libra was trying to do is actually very, very simple. Its goal, its purpose was actually to move, allow, move, moving, making moving money around the world as easy, cost effective as sending basically a WhatsApp message or sharing a picture on an email. And this, regardless of where you live, how much money you make, and what is your, prof your profession. And this was actually a very uh, noble goal that they tried to launch in, in the summer of 2019. And by the way, fun fact as well, Libra just changed its name last week. It changed its name to DM. Uh, so again, uh, staying in the Latin uh, collection of words, and they just changed their name to DM. But again, what they're trying to do, their purpose is actually still very similar. And what, it, what these guys have been trying to do is actually saying that people are able to send money around the world whenever they want in this very, with the ease of use that they have. The, and without the fees and the, and the headaches associated with traditional payments and remittances. So very interesting. But also when you look about the future of money, we're seeing also not only uh, a lot of payment companies enter the space as well. Let me give you a very simple example in the United States where companies like PayPal right now are, in, are increasingly entering the digital asset space. PayPal announced last week that they're going to make, for example, digital assets available to their over 350 million customers around the world, but in over 280 million customers they have in the US. This means that actually people can go to merchants, pay with a regular PayPal app that they have, and while they're hoarding digital assets in their wallet, actually what the merchant sees is just regular fiat money and the customer, uh, but the person holding it can hold the other digital assets. But you may say, Henry, this is very good. Remittance is a great use case. Payment is a great use case. But what about commercial transactions? Real big amount of transactions are happening between businesses around the world. Well, the big question is, can actually stable coins be used in international trade? Well, you may say, no, no, no. People are importing, exporting. They're too old school. They're not going to look at this. They're not going to be able, they're not going to be looking at leveraging this. But you know what? Actually, the data shows us now that increasingly businesses are also using uh, digital assets, particular stable coins, when it comes to cross-border payments. A good example, again, if you look at the Middle East, you'll see there's a whole, uh, it's becoming, there's not a, so the amounts are still quite uh, small. We're talking about last year, there was only about a billion dollars US of transactions that were made uh, using digital assets. But actually these numbers, when you look at them, uh, for people are using it for trade purposes, are starting to use digital assets. For example, imagine if somebody uh, in, 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 let's say, in Africa is, is actually buying some goods from a company in, 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 in other parts of Asia. Instead of actually going to a banking system with its correspondent bank keys, but correspondent banking fees, its delays, and a lot of the fees that are involved in the process, they're able to do this actually using stable coins and completely bypass the banking system, but also making it uh, uh, cheaper and, and faster from that perspective. And this is why you're seeing more and more uh, people starting to get involved in, uh, even in the Middle East, actually looking at some trading activity using digital assets. Which brings back to the question I was asking before. Can stable coins, as a second element that I covered today, 
be an opportunity for the fintech industry or uh, something that the financial services industry needs to be aware about or think about when we think about the future of money. Which brings me to the third topic and something that I'm super excited about and actually an area where the, where the kingdom of Saudi Arabia is very, very involved in is central bank digital currencies. Let's talk about it. So what is a central bank digital currencies? A central bank digital currency, short, uh, often the, used uh, CBDC, is actually a digital form of central bank money that is issued by the central bank and that is part of the monetary base of that economy. So again, if you think about it, a, des a decentralized asset like Bitcoin is, is completely decentralized. You know, nobody is able to control it. It's just out there, uh, you know, and, and, and uh, a central bank has no control on it. When it comes to actually central bank digital currency, it's a digital asset that is actually issued by the central bank. And this is very interesting, but here you may say, well, wait a second, Henry, I use digital money all the time. Whenever I'm using any of my payment apps in the kingdom, I'm actually using digital money. Well, actually, yes, you, it's correct. You are using digital money, but you're not using central bank money. And this is actually very, if I put my professor hat on for a second, it's important to understand that there is uh, really two kinds of central bank money today. First is good old cash banknotes that you could physically hold that are a liability of the central bank. So whenever you're holding a banknote in your hand, uh, you're holding up the, 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 the central bank money that is actually yours. The second type of uh, central bank money that exists are actually the reserves that your bank holds with the central bank. So what that means is actually uh, whenever if, if each one of the, 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 the banks in the kingdom and all the countries in the world have accounts with the central bank and those uh, the reserves that they hold there are actually genuine central bank money. Actually, what you hold at your bank, your deposit that you hold at your bank is actually just debits and credits or plus and minuses, if you want, uh, in the books of that a certain particular bank, but is not really central bank money. And what's super exciting is that all of us, you know, people that are listening to this webinar today, we will be the lucky generation that we're probably going to see in our lifetime certain countries adopt a third form of central bank money in the form of central bank digital currency, which is basically a digital kind of central bank money. If you want to think about a good analogy, kind of digital form of a, a banknote. And that's super exciting because really it's kind of massive innovation when it comes to the future of money. And let me give you guys a good example of this. And this is why this has been generating a lot of attention with not only central banks around the world, but also many policymakers around the world. And today, actually, according to the Bank for International Settlement, which is the club of central banks, 80% of central banks around the world are doing some kind of research on this topic, including the kingdom, of, including Sama and the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, that I've been actually, I'll talk about it in a second, very, doing very groundbreaking role, uh, work uh, when it comes to uh, wholesale CBDC. So this is something that is becoming very interesting. And to be fair, what really catalyzed this on top of the agenda of policymakers was Libra and, in 2019. And really, when you look at the kind of the activity in the space, yes, there was a lot of activity going on, but really after Libra, this could catalyze on top of the agenda. Because what's really interesting when you look at kind of the history of CBDCs, until about 2019 or mid-2019, there was a bit of pushback from it. For example, the Bank for International Settlements, again, the club of central banks that I was mentioning before, even published a paper in 2018 saying, actually, we don't need much work in the space. The current monetary system that we have is pretty good, is very solid. There's not much role of any kind of decentralized or any kind of innovation in the space which obviously we obviously at BIS, and as I show you in a couple of, couple of slides, has changed its position since, because they realize there's a lot of benefits of central bank digital currencies. For example, today, whenever there's any part of the economy that is operating in cash, any policymaker has no visibility of that economic activity in the country. However, if you move to a CBDC economy, where actually people are using digital uh, central bank digital currencies, you have a great way of actually measuring the, the impact of not only central uh, of a cer certain monetary policy, but also of certain policies that you may have uh, to try to encourage certain parts of the economy. But also the second big benefit, it actually gives us a fighting chance against the black economy and tax evasion. Again, um, if anybody is using a cash payment, it's very difficult for tax authorities, any, any, any kind of uh, government uh, 
agencies to be able to monitor what's been happening. However, as you move to digital assets like CBDCs, there's better ways of monitoring that. But I would say a third one that is actually very close to my heart is money laundering. Today, when you look at uh, uh, money laundering, is a global problem. According to a lot of the global uh, um, uh, the World Bank, today, approximately 5 to 7% of global GDP is laundered money, which is huge. So there's a lot of big chunk of actually uh, laundered transactions in the system. And in many countries, even some of the most developed ones, one that we know from a financial services perspective, we're still not able to fight it properly. For example, in the United States, where billions of dollars are spent every year and try to combat money laundering, we're still able to capture less than 1% to 2% of laundered transactions. Again, so it shows you that despite all the reg tech, regulatory technology, law tech, legal technology that we have today, we're still far from being able to tackle this issue. And what's interesting with CBDCs, it may not solve the problem easily, but at least it gives us a fighting chance against one of the biggest challenges that we have today. And there's many other benefits of CBDCs from embedding the monetary policy in, in, the, in, the, in the currency to others. And again, this was all catalyzed by Libra that came in in June 2019. But of course, this raised a lot of issues with policymakers. A lot of policymakers started looking at the topic and said, wait a second, is this something we need to be concerned about? Rightly so, and they were right. For example, you know, the big issue was if everybody is using, let's say, stable coins at the global level, what is the impact on, is there a risk of currency substitution? For example, think about if everybody is using a global currency like Libra in its original form, and everybody is comfortable using that, then what happens of certain currencies of every, every, every sovereign country? And that could cause actually a risk of a currency substitution, which is something that was actually raised. But also the other thing is actually, what about the risk of financial stability? For example, today, if somebody in a certain country doesn't trust the banking system anymore, what can they do? They go, they can go to their ATM or their cash machine, try to withdraw all the cash that they have, all the banknotes they have, try to put it somewhere safe in, in their house or a safe or whatever they have. Uh, but the, the reality is that is actually quite difficult because first of all, there's limits of how much you can withdraw from an ATM or a cash machine. There's obviously then practical issues of how you physically store it and safely store it. The big difference is with a digital currency, you could technically move it all to a digital wallet pretty quickly and actually uh, way faster than it would with a, with, a, with a paper banknote. And the problem this brings up, and actually this may uh, accelerate uh, run the banks, for example, in the event of financial st instability. So this is one of the risks that are often brought up by the FSB, for example. But also this may affect bank funding. Today, when you're depositing, you know, there's a lot of the banks are able to get uh, funding because of deposits that people have in the bank. And if people are, are withdrawing their money, that it's not something that it will be easily accessible. But another very interesting development that happened was with COVID. One thing that we saw with COVID was that actually with, with COVID was there was less demand for uh, banknotes um, for payments. Uh, people were less and less uh, comfortable touching paper banknotes because of the risk that it may uh, uh, pr pr be help in uh, spreading the virus. But I don't at the same time, we had record levels of um, hoarding of banknotes in the system. For example, people were, uh, this happens a lot of uh, times of financial stability, people try to hoard cash. And actually, this is what we're seeing now in many parts in the world, we are, although uh, there's less and less uh, banknotes being used for payments, we are at the record levels of actually uh, cash being hoarded and people are using cash in the system. And this is actually another problem that we saw during COVID. We realized actually that distributing uh, funds was very difficult. Uh, for example, one thing we were seeing was actually in the US, for example, uh, the, the tax authorities had to send over 100 million checks by post because they had no way of actually sending uh, funds in a more efficient way. And this is why actually when we look at CBDCs, these are all problems that actually central bank digital currencies may help address. But before we move forward, I think it's important that we really clarify what are the types of central bank digital currencies that we have in the system. For example, there's really right now two kinds of CBDC that I think that are important for people to understand. The first one is what we call wholesale CBDC, which is a digital currency that is issued by the central bank and that actually that is used by the various member banks that are actually involved in. 
And this is actually one area we'll talk about what, uh, what uh, the, the, K, the KSA has been doing on this particular topic. But the second type of, of CBDC is actually what we call retail CBDC. It's a digital currency uh, that is actually can be used by the public. Anybody on, the, on, this, on this webinar, it's actually a digital currency that you can able, are able to use and you're able to use on a daily basis. And this is why actually it's a very important distinction to make. For example, when you look at payments more broadly, generally when it comes to the, at the national level, the payment systems may not be perfect, but they work pretty well. You know, and this is why there's been many experiments around the world the last couple a couple of years in Canada and Singapore and South Africa. I try to look experiment with a central bank digital currency within a particular country. Uh, but again, there's been some interesting work. But really, what's really the focus is on the wholesale CBDC right now is really when it's happening at the cross-border level. And here I have to say, uh, this is one area what, what, with Project Aber, the Saudi Arabia and, and the UAE have been extremely, extremely uh, groundbreaking. I would argue that actually some of the two most ex exciting projects right now going on right now in the world when it comes to wholesale CBDC, that's the second category you're seeing right now, the cross-border wholesale CBDC is what's happening between Hong Kong and Thailand. We're trying to actually arrange this, this cross-border uh, use case, but also uh, the, the project Aber that actually was just released last Sunday, actually a week ago, a next very, very exciting project that was released. And I highly recommend that all of you, if you have not, not, not done so, to go read about Project uh, Aber uh, that was done uh, by, by, by Sama and its counterparts in the UAE, very interesting project. But also that's, the, that's at the wholesale level. What's really important to understand as well is that you have retail CBDC, which is kind of the digital, uh, 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 it, which is when a uh, central bank digital currency can be used by the public as well. And here again, you have many examples. Uh, one of them is, for example, uh, two-tiered issuance, which is one of the central bank digital currency is issued by the existing banks in the, in the network. This is what's been explored right now in Sweden, in China, in the Bahamas, in many other countries. And there's different approaches. One of them is, for example, the, what we call the platform approach, uh, which is what the UK has been using, where actually the central bank comes up with a tech platform, if you want, where financial institutions and non-banks, fintechs can come and actually plug in, if you want, from that perspective. But all these changes are becoming very, very interesting. And really, when you think about the future of money, the really the central banks are playing a leading role, uh, as we saw with, uh, with, the, with the kingdom as well, in building the future of finance. But one area that's very interesting that we need to keep an eye on, ironically, when it comes to the future of money, is actually what's happening in China. As many of you know, when you think about actually uh, fintech, uh, China is where actually a lot of the activity is taking place right now. You know, back in the day, we used to tell a lot of executives, if you want to know where the future of, of, uh, of finance is, you have to go look in Silicon Valley. But actually what turned out is actually what if you don't look find out the future of uh, fintech in many cases, it's increasingly happening now in Asia and particularly in China. And this is really the case when it comes to the future of money as well. China, for example, has been really launched a number of initiatives. For example, it has been exploring the topic of CBDCs since 2014. Again, just to put things in perspective, uh, the UK's FCA launched its uh, major consultation on CBDC in March of this year, March 2020, uh, whereas actually the China has been doing this since 2014, literally seven years ago, uh, six years ago. So very interesting what's been happening. They've been launching this big pilot right now uh, in really four of the big, big Chinese cities. And the goal they have in China is to completely replace paper banknotes and coins, not only with digital payments, because China is already de facto cashless, but really with using a central bank digital currency. And for this, they've launched already a big pilot. It's been confirmed. And what's really fascinating right now is they've been doing things at scale. For example, only in the first phase of the pilot, over $300 million has been handled uh, in this new central bank digital currency and over 12,000 use cases. Think about it, 12,000 use cases and really, we're talking thousands of wallets have been opened up. So very interesting. So really, if you want to keep an eye on what is happening on the future of money, you need to keep an eye on what's happening in China. Really, what's going to happen probably in the next couple of weeks and months are going to be a very interesting uh, overview of where the future of money may be heading from that perspective. When I bring it back again to my question, which is, again, do you think central bank digital currencies can provide opportunities not only for fintech industry, but also for the financial services industry as a whole as well? 
interesting question. And we can address it in the questions later on. And I want to finish it off on the last point, which is a tokenization. Very interesting developments that are taking place right now when it comes to tokenization. So question is, what is tokenization once again? And of course, I have the answer here. Tokenization really consists of issuing digital tokens on a blockchain where each token represents a real life asset. So let me give you a very simple analogy today. Let's say tomorrow morning, there is a big building in, let's say London, in Mayfair, London. If tomorrow morning I want to go uh, buy that big building in, in London, I cannot because obviously it costs a couple hundred millions of dollars to buy that building. You know, and this is why a lot of these large assets have what we call an illiquidity discount, which is basically only a couple of uh, 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 players, big private equity funds, sovereign wealth funds, or super wealthy individuals can go and afford these big pieces of real estate. Uh, but however, imagine if you can take that big building and actually cut that building imaginary in, in 100,000 pieces, and then every individual can buy one 100,000 of that building, for example. And that is what tokenization enables us to do. And there's a couple of benefits for that. You know, For example, imagine if you're able to actually have real estate, have it actually be able to separate into 100,000 pieces, and then this actually not only increases the pool of potential clients for market participants, but also allows us the possibility to offer assets that are not possible today. For example, think about a piece of art. You know, a big painting, a Picasso or a Andy Warhol or any other big art painting. Uh, today, you know, again, you need quite a bit of money to go buy a Picasso. But what if you're able to take that painting, separate it into 100,000 pieces and be able to offer it to people to can get a, tranche, a little tranche of it. Uh, maybe they won't be able to put it on their wall, but at least they're able to get the kind of the, the exposure to it. So very interesting elements are taking place in that space. Uh, you know, from the and, and the reason we're able to do this because blockchain enables us to really do this at a fraction of the cost it was before. So even before there were some tools that were available, uh, many countries in the world had something, for example, called REITs, but actually now you're able to do this at a fraction of the price uh, that, that we had before and because of uh, the benefits of blockchain are able to give us. But also if you think about the financial markets that we have today, if we're able to tokenize assets, think about the sh shares of a company, uh, you're able to see at all times, if you're tokenizing them, who are the shareholders of that company. Actually, today, believe it or not, with traditional financial markets, it is not that easy to know at all times who your shareholders are. You know, also when you want to do, you know, let's say a, a, a certain uh, uh, um, uh, uh, a dividend payment or others, there's actually quite a lot of administrative process that go into play. This is why another thing, this is why we have seen a lot of tokenization announcements in the last couple of months. People taking, for example, big tranches of real estate and trying to see if they can actually tokenize it or making it more accessible uh, from, from that perspective uh, to a broader audience. So this is, I'll stop here. This is really kind of the big four trends. Uh, just four examples, just four of how the digital assets, broader blockchain, can have a role when it comes to the future of money. And while we'll talk about really the future, there's a couple of things we need to think about. For example, if you're in a financial institution, you know, what are the legacy systems in that financial institution? You know, are you able to innovate using knowing the legacy systems that we have in many banks? Should we try to fix that or actually launch a brand new entity that are you able to do it? You know, what about education and awareness? This is something that is very important for anybody, whether you're a fintech or a financial institution. And this is why I think it's great with the fintech tour, this area has been covered. Education and awareness is absolutely key. So if you're working in a financial institution, are you making sure that your staff, your leadership, and people are aware of these trends going on and these innovations going on? Also, are you able to understand what is coming ahead? Understanding some of these changes going on and how actually these may impact existing businesses and also the, the industry you're involved in. But also making sure that whenever, if you're driving innovation, are you making sure that you are able to put in place the, the, the organization whether you're in a fintech or a financial institution, to be able to address these changes. What I call often many, many have been doing innovation for marketing purposes, you know, that it looks good for, uh, you know, for public relations, but actually there's not much change happening. So are you making these changes? And also senior management leading by example. If anybody, you know, listening on this and you're in any kind of leadership role, are you yourself leading by example? You know, trying to see how we can actually embrace this technology, 
trying to create awareness about these developments going on, creating edu educational sessions for people to learn about these topics, you know? So all I read these are just examples of little things that you can do to try it again. Like I mentioned before, we don't know what the future is gonna bring, but again, a lot of these changes are becoming very interesting. So again, if you think, okay, ah, oh, there's a lot of things, it's a difficult year. There's a lot of these challenges coming up. Remember this, this is the most exciting time that we've had when it comes to the future of money and the exciting time of, of, of when it comes to the future of finance as well. So thank you very much and open up for questions. And again, for people who want to follow up on this, uh, like Sagar mentioned, I have a weekly newsletter uh, on, on LinkedIn that I, I, I share every week. There's my YouTube channel. If a lot of these topics that I mentioned quickly today, I cover them in depth in my YouTube channel, a lot of educational videos, you can go learn about them. And I have these weekly videos on LinkedIn uh, and on Twitter as well, where I cover and, and I try to demystify many of these topics. So you can follow me on LinkedIn, uh, on Twitter, or on my YouTube channel. It's all under my name of Henry R. Slanian. And I'll open up for questions. Let me stop sharing my screen and I'll open it up for questions. Sagar, I'll pass the microphone back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Henry. That was that was incredible. I think everyone's sort of blown away that in such a short amount of time you've been able to cover such a huge amount of content there. So, th thank you, for, thank you very much. I think that's what probably one of the best explanations of this area that I've heard from. I'm just going to go through a few questions that we've been getting online. Sure. Um, so, first one from Saleh is: Is it correct that we'll be using that CBDCs will be using on the bridge of Ripple? Um, do we know what sort of what what sort of infrastructure do CBDCs use? Is it is it Ripple or is it other specific infrastructures which they use? Yeah, great question. Uh, I think it was Salah you mentioned. Yeah, great, great. Thank you very much, Salah. Great question. Uh, it's actually interesting because you're right. Uh, Ripple is actually and its token is called XRP. I have a use case which is between interbank and they have something called Ripple Net, which is try to connect the banks with, with, with together. I would say the closest um, that we have to that is actually the wholesale CBDC which is again, how we can take the between a central bank and the member banks to put them together. I personally believe actually we'll have actually both of them coexist for some time. I think for wholesale CBDC, it's still gonna take some time. Yes, we have some countries, including the kingdom, who are very advanced on this topic, doing pretty amazing work. Uh, but it's I think it's gonna take some time before we get a mass adoption by many of the central banks. So I think that's one of the use cases that uh, Ripple, uh, in particular with the, with the XRP are trying to solve is okay, between these interbank transfers that we're doing in the remittance space, is there a use case that can have? What is uh, what is the currency they'll be using? Um, I think it's very up to grabs right now. You're seeing many of them have been using uh, Corda. Many of them have been using Ethereum. So I think the jury is still out on what is the blockchain infrastructure that will be used. Uh, uh, and I think people will experiment with many of them over the next couple of months and years. But I think that these least the use case is actually the same. So thank you for your question, uh, Asale. And, and while we're on the CBDCs, uh, Radix asked, do you think Chinese CBDC is also a way to get back the control over private payments forms such as Alibaba and WeChat? Do you think that's one of the reasons why they're, they're looking at that? Yeah, great question. I think uh, uh, obviously there's been a lot of talk about these large technology, Alibaba, and even recently when the IPO was, was, was delayed as well. I think one thing that's important to understand, obviously there is in, in China, these big private providers have a big chunk of the payment market. I think the only uh, um, and financial and Tencent right now control over 90%. Uh, so in a way, yes, it will, it will give a bit more control if you want to a central bank, but also to be fair, it gives them a bit more visibility as well. Uh, but also the possibilities that you have with a CBDC in China, we call it the DCP, it's called digital renminbi or EUN. Uh, the, the possibilities, what you can do is way more than you could right now with the payments company. I'll give you one very simple example. Uh, you know, if you can actually embed your monetary policy directly within the currency, which is a big thing that we're able to do right now. And also, frankly, like financial inclusion. Today, if Tencent or Ant, Ant Financial don't like you, uh, they can actually block your account. Whereas one of the goals of, a, of the Chinese government is actually financial inclusion. They can put it on every phone, a digital wallet, then everybody is able to use the currency in the same way that you can always put a banknote in your pocket and use it in the same way they'll be able to do it with the digital currency. So very interesting. I really I cannot emphasize this enough. Um, and I, it's actually quite unfortunate because in the many places, especially when I give these talks in the US or other parts in the West, uh, people don't pay attention that much to China. But on this topic of the future of money and digital assets, you need to keep an eye on China. So I think your question is uh, particularly uh, on the spot. Thank you. And, and just, just another question we've got from Maze is, what's the difference between account-based CBDC and token-based CBDC? Yeah, great question. I, I normally have in my presentation here for amount of time, I had, to, I, had to, I had to cut it out, but there's two kinds of uh, uh, definition. One is token-based is really when it says that token-based CBDC is when, it's, if you're holding it, you have it. So think about a banknote. 
if you hold the banknote, you have that money and it's a token-based CBDC, the holder of it, it becomes a uh, kind of bearer instrument. You're able to have it. When it comes to account-based CBDC, it's literally you're relying on a provider to kind of give you the account. It'd be like a bank account where you go and check out your balance and you're able to use it. What's interesting actually right now, I think we're going to be, we're experimenting with both. Uh, what I think we're going to probably uh, lead out to is you're going to have a CBDC that is going to be a bit of both. Actually very similar to money today. Paper banknotes are a token base, but you have a, still have a bank account at your bank, but it's account based and you can use them both. What I think we're going to move to a CBDC era is that transactions under a certain amount will be allowed in a token based format. So again, if I give somebody a equivalent of a banknote, but again, a, a lot of transactions will still be account based. So there's two distinctions going on, uh, but I think there'll be experimentation, both token based and account based. Great question. And hopefully uh, next time I come back in the kingdom, I'll be able to go more into depth. You know, I teach now a, a 30 hour class on, on, on digital assets. So I had to cut a lot of parts out to be able to present it in 40 minutes. <laughs> and, and just one other question we've got on CBDCs is can they be devalued? I presume they would be able to be, you could devalue it, it would work in the same way as a, as normal currency, huh? Uh, can it be sorry? Can it be value what? Can it be devalued? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, actually, a CBDC is a good question. A CBDC is exactly similar to a banknote. So actually, your central bank tomorrow morning can decide to print double the amount of money that is in circulation in the country. And actually, then as, as the supply increases, technically the value may decrease. So actually, CBDC is very similar to what we call the kind of the monetary base of the country. So actually, one CBDC dollar is in theory equivalent to one dollar a banknote. So it's exactly similar from that perspective. Great question. Sorry, then the other questions which we've got just around cryptocurrency more generally. How mature are um, regulations around digital assets tokenization in Saudi? I think that's something which is uh, we've seen good progress in with Sama and with Project Abur, and I think that we will see more interest in that. But you're generally talking from a sort of international perspective. Are you seeing regulations becoming more matured in these areas and giving people more confidence? Yeah, absolutely. I think around the world now, we're seeing a lot of actual clarity. Like I mentioned before, 95% of, of, of uh, regulators are, have somebody working on it. It's obviously a very complex topic because you guys know the space moves very, very fast. Remember my dog example at the beginning that a day is like seven days. So things move actually very, very fast. It's actually very difficult for regulators to keep on top. I have to say, though, regulators have done a pretty good job around the world on uh, being staying on top of this asset, uh, on, of this development. I have to say, when it comes to Saudi, I'm very impressed. I have to say Project Aber is, when it comes to wholesale CBDCs, um, definitely, definitely top two in the world right now when it comes to the development of wholesale CBDC. Again, uh, if you want great reading for the weekend, I highly recommend you read the, I think, 60, 70 pages of Project Aber, but that's how I spent my last weekend reading it. Very, very interesting developments going on there. And, and just in terms of generally in cryptocurrency, we've got one question here about when, when you hear somebody says, you know, Bitcoin can reach $300,000 next year, what, how, how, are they, how are they coming up with these numbers? What's, what, <laughs> what is it based on? Yeah, it's a question I get a lot from the media on TV. Obviously, right now, if you look at all the experts, uh, literally, I mean, Citibank last week predicted that Bitcoin may be worth $320,000. Uh, Allianz Bernstein and, and, uh, and Bloomberg uh, last week said it's going to be worth $50,000 lot next year. It's actually very difficult, actually, and, you know, to, to measure the value. The way people try to look at it, actually, when it comes to Bitcoin in particular, it's purely offer and demand. So a lot of people try and look, okay, if today the market cap of Bitcoin is around, let's say, uh, $400 billion or whatever it is right now, many would say, no, actually, it should be bigger than that. And that's how they're, they're trying to come up with valuation methodologies. When it comes to Bitcoin, it's actually quite straightforward. It's really offer and demand. So as you think more people are, want to buy it, uh, there'll be more demand on it. The one thing, as you know, with Bitcoin, actually, there's a finite supply. With Bitcoin, there's only going to be 21 million Bitcoin ever. There's about 90 million that are issued right now. Every 10 minutes, you have 6.25 Bitcoin that are created, if you want. So the monetary policy is very, very clear. Uh, we know exactly how many new currencies will be created until the year 2140, actually. So it's a, it's a pretty clear perspective. So it's very difficult to do quantitative easing with Bitcoin. This is why a lot of people are seeing that as a hedge uh, compared to uh, currencies, a bit very similar to gold, if you want, but probably in a, in a way that is actually even more precise, what is the total supply? And, and do you think that part of that is going to be more institutions like banks holding cryptocurrency, which right. is going to then lead to the value change? Absolutely. I mean, I think when you look at the, at the current rally you're seeing in the markets right now, it's being driven by institutional investors. I mean, you saw a lot of the big hedge funds, Renaissance Technologies, you had the Paul Tudor Jones and the likes who have made up very public. They're looking at crypto. You had many of the influencers, you know, uh, you know, like guys like Stanley Duncan Miller and others who have been very vocal and, and actually even uh, money, uh, monetary historians like Neil Ferguson speak in favor of crypto. So I think this rally 
rally, unlike the other one, the 2017, is being driven by institutional investors. A couple of reasons to it. One of them, there's now a lot of instruments for institutional investors to have exposure to crypto assets, which they didn't have before. Like, for example, Bitcoin futures on the CME, uh, products like Grayscale in the US and others. So there's a lot of products people can have access to they didn't have before. And frankly, there's a lot of the regulated product providers right now, regulated exchanges, regulated custodians. And these did, did not even exist three years ago. So the, the marketplace, the landscape has changed quite a bit. So that's why you have a lot of institutional uh, interest uh, on, the, on this perspective. Thank you. And, and yes, has got another great question here, which is around asset backed tokenization. Do you think that this is going to make owning physical assets more, more mainstream? Um, is this yeah. going to lead to the death of something like crowd, crowdfunding, for example? Because if everyone can then uh, tokenize assets, then, then do you need to have these sort of other platforms to be able to do the same? I actually don't think it's going to destroy crowdfunding. At the contrary, it may even help it because basically you can take any assets now, tokenize it. I can do it, let's say, in my house. I can take my personal house, tokenize it, and be able to offer it pieces of art. Uh, when it comes to stuff like non-fungible tokens, for example, think about everybody on the on the on this webinar who plays video games. Many of you own assets in the video game, you know, and actually we're going to be able to put those. What we call those actually non-fungible tokens. We'll be able to put those on a blockchain. So great examples from real estate to art uh, to actually, frankly, a financial service and market. So I don't think it, I think it's going to make it easier for people to hold. It's going to bring more liquidity. Uh, easier, uh, more less uh, uh, less costly to transfer them. You don't need to go. You don't need to go by intermediaries. So I think overall, but it's going to take some time. Uh, we're still at the very, very early days of the broader tokenization movement. Uh, it's. I mean, just yesterday, uh, it, was, it was some exchanges around the world that are now announcing tokenized securities, where you can take a, let's say, an Amazon stock that is worth three thousand US dollars. Maybe you don't have that three thousand dollars, but you can buy one one hundredth of it. So it actually creates. Uh, uh, fractional holdings. I think so. There's a lot of developments we're going to see over the coming years. We're still, but it's still going to move slowly and slowly on that perspective. And then uh, appreciate we're, we're getting, we're running out of time. So just one, one final question, Henry. Just going back to your presentation around the opportunities uh, that you see in in this space, particularly from fintechs for fintech entrepreneurs. Where, where do you see the biggest opportunities happening in 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 the four areas you mentioned very briefly over the next five to ten years? Yeah, I think the four topics that I mentioned today, there's going to be a lot of opportunities in there. The most important things people to be aware about, you know, keep educated on this topic, keep reading, you know, either, you know, uh, so there's books like mine and others you can read, keep on YouTube channels, uh, LinkedIn channels, you need to be educated because there's always new opportunities coming up. For example, though, you know, a gaming industry, I mentioned, you know, like video games, non-fungible tokens. This is something that didn't exist a couple of years ago. Tokenization, you know, and central bank digital currencies, all these developments bring up, I would say, across the fintech ecosystem, new opportunities. So when I look at digital assets, I see them as an enabler to the broader fintech ecosystem because a lot of various participants in the fintech ecosystem will benefit from this. Uh, you know, so that's, I think that's very, very exciting from that perspective. Excellent. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. Uh, Henry, on behalf of Fintech Saudi, thank you so much for a fantastic presentation. I think we've had a lot of participants, a lot of engagement um, at this lunchtime session. So I really, really appreciate your time today. Thank you very much. I look forward to being back in person, hopefully physically in the kingdom soon again. So thank you very much, everybody. It was a pleasure. And I look forward to staying in touch with you all with, with social media, like I said. But that's probably the best way to keep in touch with me. Thank you very much, Sagar. And thank you very much, everybody at the Fintech Saudi for allowing me to share my passion of the future of money with you all. Thank you. No, thank you, Henry. And thank you all to participants for joining this lunchtime session as well. I uh, really appreciate your input and the questions. And I'm sure you've had a great, great session today. Um, if you'd like to hear more great speakers like Henry as well, feel free to go to Fintech Saudi's website and register for some of the other sessions which we have on the Fintech Tour this week, particularly a session from Sama on CBDCs on Thursday. So that could be quite an interesting one as well. Um, and awesome. thank you. Thank you very much for everyone for participating. Thank you. Thanks, Henry. Take care. Thank you. Bye.